Well, it felt like it took ages to get here, 148 days to be exact, but Hollywood writers finally have a deal with the studios. Today on the podcast, you'll hear the stories of two writers who have been picketing almost every day and how they feel about the future of their work. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, after almost five months on strike, Hollywood writers are finally getting a break from picketing. That is because there is a tentative deal on the table. Their union leaders are going to vote on it. That's going to happen today. The Writers Guild of America calls a deal, quote, exceptional. The specifics are still not public yet, but let's just say the vibe is definitely hopeful. The vibe is actually like, all hail the conquering heroes. Catherine, Catherine Burrell and Jackie Penn have both been on strike for 148 days. They are both on the show today. Catherine, Jackie, welcome to Commotion. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having us. Look at these big yes, smiles on your faces. Hey, like this, <laughs> this is just, there's, we're not even like in, into the conversation. We're just like, yeah, we're, we're, we're lighting up, thinking and talking about this. How are we feeling? I texted Jackie earlier because we're both captains at Warner Brothers and I was like if I I, I will cry through the interview and I'm I, and she was like you won't and I was like I'm just about to so I mean yeah, I, I feel like that's been it, lots of like crying at random, <laughs> random moments. Catherine are you literally crying right now is that what I'm, is that what I'm looking at is that what's happening? Yeah, it, it was. It's it's just, okay. and it, it has been an emotional time. You know, 148 days, and uh, and the we we became we became a family on the line. And yeah. it's mm-hmm. you know, I'm looking at Jackie, and I'm just like, oh, I'm not going to get to see her every day. And that's, no, don't, don't you make me start crying. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's you know, we we yelled at a wall for. 148 days and and marched and became camp counselors and therapists on the line and uh yeah. so it's been pretty bittersweet it's wonderful that we have a tentative deal and is i'm so excited to see the deal points i'm so excited to get back to work but i'm going to miss these people yeah. so much and so i much. need to figure yeah. out how to keep away keep an access point to my strike self and and these people who are my family now well in yeah. a way that's the point of solidarity right in a way that's sort of like yes. a reminder that you you share the space together jackie you sort of share both an emotional and a literal space together and then you get a chance to reinforce that over every single day how is that for you i mean just what Catherine said like it's really weird you know like yesterday yeah. was like oh it's a holiday so it, it kind of felt like oh we're just taking a pause but today i'm like waking up and like my routine for the past five months has been like you know i do my workout i like do my breakfast and then i head over to like gate four at Warner Brothers to help set up. And like, yeah. that is not what I'm doing today. So it's, it's again, bittersweet. I'm very happy that we have a tentative deal, but again, I've seen these people, it's about the length of a room. Yeah. So they're like family now. It's yeah, it's very bittersweet. So I want to go back to the moment Sunday night, Catherine, you open up your email, you read the news that there's a tentative deal. Uh, how did you feel? I felt I, I felt stunned. I felt numb. Uh, it, it, I, mm. it, it was, it was so hard because there were these, these points earlier on where, you know, we were going back to the table. That was exciting. It seemed as though the, uh, our, our, our enemies, the AMPTP were going to negotiate in good faith. They did not. I allowed myself a huge spike of hope back in August mm-hmm. and um, felt, and, and when we realized that they were playing dirty tricks, they had not come back to the table in good faith. I, the, the, the level of desperation and confusion that I felt, I was like, I, I had to, I, I had to make sure to n- have that not happen again. Yeah. So when we came back to the table this time, it was this funny thing where Jackie, when did we go back to the table on, on Wednesday or Thursday? Of on last Wednesday, week? It was Wednesday. Wednesday. Last week. So Wednesday, we were all on tender hooks at the end of the day. It says they are going back to the table on Thursday, Thursday, we're all on tender hooks. At the end of Thursday, we get another email that says they're going back to the table on Friday. We're like, okay, it's not yeah. falling apart. It's not falling apart. So by the time the deal was there, I, I it, it took a second to, to to sink in and and for me to process it, and then it was just this explosion of, uh, you know, grief, relief. Yeah. Um, I, I've never felt anything like it. Actually, it was just it was very yeah. very conflicting emotions, c- confusing to process. Jackie, yeah. you you also look like you're kind of overwhelmed with emotion. I just I'm sorry to say this, but I creeped your Instagram a little bit, and I saw all your mm-hmm. posts of celebration. You know, Sunday night, uh, Monday, yeah. like. And it's just people gathered. It looked like people were just screaming, like just like screaming total sort of excitement. 
I mean, especially for like the captains, I feel like we've been really having to hold everything together for everyone else because like Catherine said, people are coming to us or looking to us for questions. So like, you know, when you're a strike captain, you like set the tone kind of thing. We set the tone, right? So trying to make people sure people are safe, that they're informed. So I feel like we really like haven't been feeling our own emotions. Mm. And I think maybe that's part of the release of like all of this stuff is like, oh, I've been holding it. I've been holding it in for like almost five months. And now it's like the end. And you're like, wait, what? Like, so I, I think that's why it's like, we don't know how to feel yet. I think we're trying to process all of the feelings that we weren't feeling before. Right. And now can really like feel them. So yeah. yeah, the text message that I was getting from the other captains, we, we have this one wonderful woman named Anne Slichter, uh, who was on strike in 2007, 2008. And she was like, I am in delayed grief. I Nothing is coming out of me. And then yesterday I was standing at a bus stop and she's like, that's it. I'm crying in Beverly Hills. I'm crying at La Pan Cotidiana. And I just tipped the waiter $50 because I don't know where to put it. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so I think that everyone's, it's coming in waves. Uh, yeah, for sure. Catherine, in this moment, the deal – it's a deal in principle on, on all contract points, which, as I mentioned, you know, the WGA called exceptional. Based on what you heard, everything about this deal, what are you – what do you feel most excited about? I feel most excited about the idea that when this strike began, it was so existential. It felt like mm. we were fighting – we were fighting for the soul of our industry and for the soul of our creativity. <laughs> and – and it felt like it felt like an archetypal story, right? It's classic David and Goliath, and and the fact that you know our negotiating committee is very conservative too. When so with the fact that they're saying that it's exceptional, I believe that it is exceptional. I believe that mm. no one got left behind on all of the major points. Um, but I, I, for me, I'm, I'm kind of taking a ten thousand foot view and thinking, you know. We, we've we never lost one of these. I knew we were going to win, but the fact that I think we're winning a, a historic deal feels really special and important, and it feels like I want to say to everyone, we have, we're a bunch of idiot dreamers, and we went up against a bunch of billionaires, and we won, and to, to know that the power of labor is that powerful, to know that we um, were able to throw our bodies on the line every day and mm. and and make it, it just, it, it feels so hopeful. I, mm. I, yeah. I just feel hopeful, and I can't, I sort of can't believe it, because hope is the enemy for me usually, and I, yeah, I feel hope, it feels incredible. I, as you were speaking, Catherine, Jackie was wiping tears from her eyes. She I mean, started to cry. Is, right. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is like a highly, highly emotional yeah. time. And I think that's it's understandable because um, we don't remember just like the intensity of the start of the strike, but also there were all those like, you know, leaked reporting that said that like the studios wanted to break the backs of the writers and then to come around five months later, Jackie, and see that the the Writers Guild at least reportedly got all the things that they were asking for. Um, it feels like a massive, massive sort of victory. I, I will say like a deal in theory is not a deal without any kind of compromise. Are you hearing about right. any concessions that make you go, <clears throat> um, this is something I'm worried about in the future? Or are you just kind of in the ecstasy of the moment? I, I think I'm not worried because, uh, again, I, I really do, you know, comparing language as, you know, writers do, we're like, analyze things. And there yeah. was someone who was in the 2007, 2008 strike, and they sent the email that they got when they got the tentative, like, oh, we have a deal. And they compared it to the email that they sent to us on Sunday. And the language from 2007, eight and now is completely different. So mm. I really do feel like in 2007, 2008, they won. But there was like still some mm, could it have been like the best language. Maybe there could have been some like, uh, you know, better language used and more protection. But I really do feel like Catherine said they they have been so like conservative with how they're like trying not to. They were managing our expectations like yeah. they're coming back to the table. This doesn't mean that we're going to have a deal. So like. I think for them to say that, I really do feel like they knew, right? They're experiencing it just like the rest of the membership mm-hmm. that this was like a breaking point for not only us, but like the other people, you know, in our industry. So um, I have like faith that, yeah, that this is, this deal is going to be, you know, good. I mean, not to say that we're not going to have to like figure out life going Forward, post of course, strike, but I really do do believe that um, the things that we were fighting for, um, I believe that we made we made gains in that those areas. So, uh, Catherine, last time you were on the show, which was in July, we were talking about 
people losing their apartments, people who can't afford groceries. Um, and you were saying that uh, that the writers would keep going no matter what the immediate impact was. There was sort of this understanding of exactly what you said earlier, which is like this is an existential turning point in in um, in your careers and in this particular line of work. Do you think the resolve shifted along the way as a strike dragged on? 148 days is a long time to be on strike. I think we got tired, but I don't think the resolve shifted because mm. I think that we all knew this. The thing I keep saying is that it feel it's, to me, it feels like this strike. There was such a high degree of literacy in terms of the issues. We also had we were all communicating with. You know, I hate social media. It drives me crazy. This was this was a moment where. Twitter and Instagram was so crucial in terms of mm-hmm. any any time there was a sneaky move from the press yeah. or from the AMPTP or stories that were being seeded through the trades by the AMPTP. Right away, Twitter, Instagram, the incredibly smart people, the incredibly smart writers and analysts there were like, this This is this is what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They, are, they are trying to break your resolve via this. They're trying to break your resolve via PR, via messaging, via whatever. And, and, and I think so, that's why they... That's why they lost, right? I mean, because yeah. we were able to con- to continue to control the messaging, and this is not 2007, right? Like this is 2023, and like yeah. times are different. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They got knocked down every time, and so and so I, I so because those those rumors uh, and, and those uh, yeah because th- those rumors were not allowed to take hold because and and we were and every t- and every single time. One of us felt bad in private because we had to be private about it as captains because we were wearing orange safety vests, which yeah. meant that we were we were the ones who had to take care of everyone. We would assemble around them and and figure out how to make our people feel better. That was part of our job. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we had a captain on the line who did lose her home. You know, she's she's in the process of driving to Flagstaff, Arizona right now to live with family. Ooh. But I know that she'll be back. And <laughs> and 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 if you talk to her and she's she's been public about this, her name is Sarah. If you talk to Sarah about it, she doesn't she doesn't not believe in the strike. She's not angry about it. She's just like this was we were fighting for the soul of the thing. Mm. And and we won it. And she's like I feel free. It's very confusing. I don't know what's going to happen next, but this fight was not an option. We had to do yeah. it. I, uh, Jackie, I got to ask you, when you think about the financial sacrifices, the ones like the one that we just heard about, when somebody like loses their home, right? Um, you have to think that there was maybe, you know, a moment when you like losing the health insurance. Like those are, those are really big sacrifices. Was there ever any, ever any moment for you where you're like, I don't think I can keep this going for the long haul? Did that doubt start to set in? Even, I mean, even if it's private, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. There's definitely those moments, you know, I luckily, uh, I'm married. And so I have a spouse who is working, not, I mean, LA is expensive. Yeah, <laughs> so like trying to survive on one income, uh, is tricky. Um, and so I had his support, but it's definitely like, okay, what are we, what are we cutting back on? What do we have to get rid of to like, try to like really think about, um, how to survive. There's, there was talk of like maybe getting into his pension, like taking right. money out of that just to like, you know, um, to survive it, like savings, like what savings now? I, I don't know. Like, cause that's almost all gone, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, I was one of these people actually who was scheduled to lose coverage for their health insurance um, on October 1st uh, because we had gone on so long that like my health insurance was going to be done. And then uh, we just learned, I think yesterday officially, and they were saying that they were hopeful, hopeful this was happening, that they're going to extend us until, um, until, December. So I did not lose health insurance, um, Mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, But yeah, I was very, I mean, days away from it. So yeah. Mm -hmm. That close. Uh, Catherine, I got to say, at the end of the day, yes, the rhetoric got so nasty at certain times. You know, there was a feeling that the studio bosses were just saying all the quiet stuff out loud and they're saying it quite, um, you know, in let's say impolite ways. Now you got to go back and work with these people, right? You got to go back and work with with these studios. Um, Is it tough to sort of consider the prospect of going back to work with the quote unquote enemy in this particular case? Uh, I think my biggest friend is going to be cognitive dissonance. (laughs) 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 I'm going to, I'm going to hold on tight to that concept. Yes. No, I, I was thinking about this this morning because just as Jackie said, yesterday was, was a pause. We were, we were, and and today we're, we're going to go out and pick it with SAG after like, I'm going to see Jackie in an hour and a half with the actors. We're going to be back. We're going to be back yes. at Warner Brothers, walking in solidarity with them. And so, as I as I was thinking about what what mood I'm going to bring into that scenario, I was like, who am I in service of every day when I am at work? I am in service mm-hmm. of if I'm in a writer's room, I'm in service of my fellow writers. 
uh, and I am in service of the story that we are telling. When I am at my desk writing a script by myself, I am in service of my characters. Mm-hmm. I'm not in service of the CEOs. I never have been. These mm-hmm. and and the other thing, and I'm going to be petty because they were they were petty. I don't think that Bob Iger is happy. I don't think that Ted Sarandos is happy. I don't no. think that seven yachts make a life. <laughs> and and what I saw mm. on the line every single day, and I know that Jackie believes this too, I saw friendship and community and solidarity and 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 energy that was coming from such a pure place. Mm. And they don't have that. They have individualism. They have houses with properties where the other houses don't touch them. They don't see other people. And so I am so happy that they are existentially miserable and that we are <laughs> A team, and and so and and I, I am being a jerk, but I don't care. No, because uh, I believe it. <laughs> that and what a place for us to leave it, Catherine, Jackie. I wish you luck as you sort of wait for the details of the deal to sort of come forward at them later today, and you end up getting a chance to vote on it. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your raw emotions and this really yeah. exciting moment. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank of for course. Having us. Of course. See you, Jackie. See you in an hour. Okay. All right. See ya. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Catherine Burrell is a Canadian screenwriter in Los Angeles, and Jackie Penn is also a screenwriter in LA. They're both waiting for more details to come out about the detail that could end the strike they've been on for 148 days. Hi there, my name is Elamine Abdul Mahmoud, and this is Commotion. Stravinsky's The Firebird Suite, that is the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony, one of the most celebrated orchestras in Canada. Last week, news broke that the KW Symphony would stop its operations and file for bankruptcy. That news came out just as the 2023 2024 season was expected to kick off. It sent shockwaves across Canada's live orchestra industry. Catherine Carlton is the executive director of Orchestras Canada, a not for profit organization that is dedicated to helping build a vital and sustainable future for Canadian orchestras. They represent 144 orchestras across the country. Catherine is with me now. Hi, Catherine. How are you? I'm uh, still processing the news. It is a, 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 you know, a shock yeah. to the foundation of, of what we do and what we believe in. I can, I can imagine. What was your reaction when you first heard it? I cried. Hmm. Tell me about that. Um, I, I worked for the Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony for five years at two different points in my career. Mm-hmm. I know the community. Uh, I have friends on the board, friends in the orchestra, friends on the staff team. I know what they have brought to that community over the 78 years of, of their history, mm. although I didn't work there that long. And, you know, I, you know, just thinking about the, the dislocation mm-hmm. that those folks are feeling at this point, uh, the sense of, you know, questions about the future, where, where, where this might potentially go, uh, reach of promise to audience members, to members of the youth orchestras, you know, you name it. It's uh, it's a community tragedy. I uh, I guess I'm, I'm, let's try to paint a bit more of a, like a, a, a picture for people um, in terms of what the consequence, the most immediate consequences of this might be, because we're hearing stories of musicians who were either expecting their first paycheck, like literally this week, they're not getting that anymore. Uh, people who just moved to the city to begin working there too, right? Like tell us a little bit about the implications of that for for people. Sure. The implications are, first of all, massive questions about whether they can stay in the community and hope that something will build up or not, whether that is financially possible for them or not. Hmm. Um, Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony did treat its musicians as employees, so many of them were collecting employment insurance over the summer. That may bridge them for a few weeks, but EI is not indefinite. Mm. Uh, staff members uh, similarly may be in a position to be able to collect employment insurance. But there, for those who are starting their jobs with the orchestra, and there were a number of new mus- musicians starting work, they didn't have the insurable weeks. And they must be asking serious questions at this point. They moved to town, paid rent, did all the things, all ready to start, and uh, they don't have a backstop. Uh, some of the reporting that I've seen points to actually the pandemic being like a significant factor in the K- Kitchener Waterloo sort of situation. Can you just give us a sense of why the pandemic might have affected uh, an orchestra in that way? Sure. I mean, we've been measuring the impact of the pandemic on orchestras right across the country. And although mm. it has played out 
differently as we emerge from the pandemic. Uh, the immediate impacts were obviously two and a half years of massive disruption. Um, immediately in that famous day in mid-March of 2020, uh, orchestras learned uh, pretty much at the same time that the work that is at the very heart of what they do, mm. bringing groups of people together to work in close proximity in an enclosed space for larger groups of people sitting in close proximity in a close in yeah. an enclosed space, right? You know, it, it, basically what you're told is the work that you've spent your entire life doing, getting ready for, honing, uh, and and getting ever better at. Is, yeah. is suddenly impossible. And for two and a half years, people did their level best to patch over, to perform live when they could, when that was actually possible. Big digital pivot, um, which produced a lot of activity, some of it touching, beautiful, funny, and great, uh, and no revenue model attached to it. Uh, and no real ability to, to say to an audience, we're planning an event on this date. We invite you to join us in the Ooh. hall to participate when you didn't know if there'd be a fresh form of, of, of COVID, if there'd be government shutdowns, any of those things. So massive disruption. Uh, we are coming out of it now, but we are certainly noticing very different kinds of paces of return right. uh, to full-on performance in different cities across the country. I mean, I also think it's safe to say that all orchestras across Canada are now, they're trying their hardest, right, to balance the demand, but also the, they're keeping the lights on, right? Like the Regina Symphony Orchestra said, ticket sales are dwindling. The Toronto Symphony Orchestra has been talking about, you know, pushing diversity at the leadership level, but also pushing diversity in terms of audiences. The people who come out to the shows are trying to diversify those people too. How do you think Canadian orchestras can stay competitive in this particular environment? I think you know there, there's a there's a couple of things that really show up under the banner of relevance. Mm. Um, one is uh, uh, you know the practical fact of management, which is that you have to have enough cash on hand to be able to to do experiments and not expect about a thousand. Right. Right. You know we we know this from tech. We know this from you know pretty much any kind of uh, of, of business operation. Nothing can bat a thousand, but especially nothing this, can right? bat a thousand. Yeah. And you you actually need a bit of a margin yeah. to be able to try stuff, see who comes, uh, you know, make it better, uh, abandon it if possible. But then also baked into that that kind of capacity for innovation. You know, there's it, it, it talks about programming. It talks about how to, how we define uh, audiences existing and new, where we go find them, where we perform for them, mm -hmm. what repertoire we play. I mean, we already know based on some research that we did with the fabulous people at BIPOC Voices uh, this last spring that Canadian orchestra's repertoire has diversified significantly. Mm -hmm. Big uptick in the performance of music by women, music by uh, equity-seeking, equity-deserving composers of, of a range of kinds. I mean, it's it's happening. Can it happen fast enough? Can we bring the existing audiences along with us? Um, or are we going for an entirely different audience? And, you know, how do we find them? How do we introduce them to, to the wonderful world of orchestra? Right. A lot of experiments going on right now, but you need the cash to be able to do the experiments and learn from them. Catherine, uh, we got about a minute left. You know, right now I'm talking to you about the state of orchestras in Canada. But before I was talking to Catherine Burrell and Jackie Penn about the writer strike in Hollywood, before I let you go, do you see a through line between what's happening over there and what orchestras are dealing with here in Canada? I love that interview. What what fabulous strong women! Yeah. Uh, just mind boggling uh, to to think about their leadership. What I see as a through line is ongoing challenges and conversations about what it is and what it takes to be an artist who can lead, lead a life of dignity and mm. contribution in communities. Unlike you know, media industry, there aren't major headquarters of orchestra in Canada. We've got 144 members. They are distributed coast to coast, communities small and large. What it takes to uh, keep a group of musicians working right. happy productive in Kitchener, yeah. what it takes in Toronto, what it takes in Vancouver. Um, you know, that's what we're fighting for. And that's a management board, musician, community uh, uh, piece of work that we need to do together. Catherine, I really appreciate you giving us that context and for being on the show today. Thank you so much for your time. What a pleasure. Thank you so much, Elamine. Of course. Good day. Catherine Carlton is the Executive Director of Orchestra Canada, a not-for-profit organization that helps promote orchestras across the country. By the way, we should mention that uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo Youth Orchestra has found a home at Wilfrid Laurier University. That is it for our show today. My name is Alamin Abdul-Mahmoud. 
I'm going to be here tomorrow. I hope that you are too. I'll see you then. <laughs>